trials about the various phases that clinical trials go through. Uh, and today, as Sir just pointed out, we will be looking at the history of clinical trials. Uh, we'll follow the same methodology. First, Sir will deliver the lecture. You can write down your questions in the chat box in the meantime, or after the end of the discussion, we will open the floor for questions. Uh, sir, is it fine? Okay, this is great. Yeah. Uh, okay. Over to you, Sir. Well, we, any, uh, I think yesterday when we ended, we didn't have enough time. Uh, yesterday we covered what we what I was saying uh, about the, um, the scientific aspect. Uh, we discussed why clinical trials are required. It's, uh, clinical trials are experiments, and uh, they become necessary because at some stage, the new drug device or new you know procedures or uh, or even uh, diagnostic uh, methods, they have to be tried out on the human being at some stage in order to you know discover new things. And uh, we also talked about uh, the preclinical phase that is laboratory and animal experiment, and then coming to the clinical phase, which is the human experimentation phase, and the four phases of the clinical trial. Uh, and uh, I, I had circulated a paper by Dr. Uh, Arun Bhatt earlier, which gives you a, a long history, you know, starting from uh, you know uh, early times till now about how scientifically clinical trials develop. We picked up a few things from there, like uh, designs of the clinical trial that you require uh, uh, a, a control arm or the comparator uh, against uh, the experimental arm. And why there is a need for randomization in order to avoid uh, uh, you know, biases in the selection of the participant. We also talked about blinding, you know, where uh, investigator as well as the the um, uh, participant doesn't know who is getting what so all these issues we had covered yesterday if you have any question uh, we said yesterday that if uh, we will have a we'll take question to begin with in case you have otherwise uh, i can go ahead with uh, today's presentation and then you can have questions anybody uh, having any pressing need to comment or or, or ask question, whatever. You can make a comment or so if you disagree, there is no problem. You can always talk about it. Okay. Um, so uh, just very yes. briefly, so, so yesterday when you were uh, answering the question of mm -hmm. uh, the standard of approval for Indian drugs and vaccines in other countries, um, it had actually become a little late, so uh, we missed part of your answer. So if you could just very briefly uh, uh, explain that once more. Uh, well, I think that you had asked this question, right? That why Indian vaccine is not recognized by the uh, regulators in Europe and uh, in America and WHO. Yes. Right? Uh, so, there, I mean, you have two types of vaccines. Vaccines which were developed uh, through clinical trials abroad. Right, you have a AstraZeneca vaccine, which was developed by AstraZeneca company uh, by doing clinical trials in UK, USA, uh, South Africa, and Brazil. While they did not carry out uh, large scale phase three clinical trials in India, what they did in India was a bridge study where they had about 1200 participants in order to see that it works in on Indian population, and they also did what is called the non inferiority trial to show that uh, Serum Institute of India, which is producing uh, 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 AstraZeneca vaccine, because you know the AstraZeneca vaccine in India was taken up with the seeding uh, from the vaccine that was developed uh, in UK. So uh, uh, it shows that uh, uh, the vaccine uh, that is uh, being produced by Serum Institute is as good as the original vaccine that was developed by in, in UK. Uh, so only these trials were carried out. Unfortunately, uh, uh, that COVID shield, uh, that uh, Serum Institute vaccine, all the data are still not in the public domain. And uh, that is a, 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 one reason why there is some struggle. But COVID shield is uh, getting better recognition internationally as compared to COVAXIN. COVAXIN uh, was developed uh, uh, by ICMR, that is a, a virology institute in Pune. In uh, collaboration with uh, Bharat, uh, uh, you know, uh, the biotech. So uh, this is a 
completely indigenous vaccine. It was tested in India. It had some controversy. There was a big uh, controversy came out from Bhopal, where uh, they found that uh, people were not told that it was an experiment going on, and then uh, there was a uh, uh, there given money to participate and that kind of stuff. But apart from that, what the government did that when the clinical trial was on, they suddenly provided emergency approval to it, saying that it should be made available in clinical trial mode. And after clinical trial got over, they gave them, you know, the emergency uh, approval uh, uh, completely. Now, uh, uh, the data of this uh, Provexin trial, Indian trial, they're still not in public domain. Actually, uh, funny part is that if you go to the Canadian uh, uh, Drug Regulatory Agency's website, you will find some of the data of the COVAX in there, because uh, I think uh, uh, the COVAX in tried to penetrate the market in Canada, so they had to submit data. And according to their rule, the Canadian Drug Agency put down put the data up on their website for other people to see. But uh, uh, if you do go to the website of CDSCO, the data are still not up. The paper based on those data are still not published. Now, that makes it extremely difficult, you know, and that is one of the reasons. I think you have pointed out that, uh, that the lack of transparency is uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, Indian uh, pharmaceutical is suffering, you know, and not getting uh, easy recognition. I think WHO and others will give recognition as soon as uh, complete data sets are submitted to them. Another uh, uh, question, point that I can uh, you know, mention is that when AstraZeneca trial or uh, the trial of uh, mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer and others who brought out, if you go on their website, you'll find the full protocol, the project proposal, including the data collection tools and what kind of analysis they were planning to carry out, you'll find on their website. And you can download it and study it. But uh, uh, the uh, uh, Covaxin trial, you will never find any, 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 any protocol being made public. So all the uh, um, uh, uh, vaccines which were developed in developed countries, their protocols are available. But our own uh, you know, Zydus, which was again indigenous one, and uh, that protocol you will never find. So the entire protocol may run into four to 500 pages, but the basic protocol will be about 150 pages. And then, then there are uh, investigators, brochure, and what kind of data collect, you know, uh, and the tables and all, which uh, uh, many of them don't provide, but at least the basic one, you know, uh, which gives you the design of the trial, what kind of people will be recruited, how they will be protected, and all these other issues including the informed consent form, those are made available in the developed countries. But our regulator is not strong enough. And uh, uh, we wrote, uh, at least uh, uh, 20 of us, uh, along with Dinesh Thakur, you know Dinesh Thakur, who became very famous uh, for uh, doing whistleblowing on the data fudging by the Randbeck seat. We all wrote a letter to the, to the uh, uh, Drug Controller General of India asking for making you know, all these uh, protocols public uh, where uh, Indian uh, um, you know, vaccines are being tried. So if you become secretive, it becomes uh, you know, less likely for uh, the developed countries to give recognition to your, your stuff. So they will not uh, uh, behave the way our uh, regulator is behaving. They will ask for full data set, findings of the file, and, and, and you have to show that it uh, produces more benefit and protection as compared to the potential harm that it may have. So that is uh, uh, one of the reasons why we are suffering. And uh, perhaps uh, I think uh, Indian companies uh, do not uh, see a big market for their vaccine abroad. Because there are other vaccines uh, which are developed by the developed countries. And uh, they are available in ample quantities in Europe and North America. So they don't bother. They think that perhaps we can export this vaccine, our vaccine, to underdeveloped countries which don't have good uh, drug regulator at all, worse than ours. So, you know, they want to capture that market. And so they don't bother to be transparent. 
and uh, you must have known that Covaxin had a uh, had an agreement with Brazil to provide uh, Covaxin, uh, you know, this vaccine there, and uh, and there were uh, allegations of corruption and uh, underhand dealing and that kind of stuff, and ultimately it fell through, and so we are not able to because uh, Brazil has uh, like India a very strong pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry, Brazil, South Africa. You know, these are the uh, developing countries uh, which are having as good uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry base as we are having. We are much better as compared to them, but they are also having their stuff. And so ultimately, it uh, fell through, you know, despite uh, uh, the president of the Brazil and Indian prime minister being good friends, uh, they did not allow it to, to go. So I'm sorry, I, I feel bad about it that our vaccines are not getting recognized, but then we are not doing enough to get recognition either. So it's a, it's a, it's a there partly, yes, you can say that they have bias against us, but at the same time, I would not uh, quarrel with the demand because I am making demand also that co-vaccine data should be available to you and me, same way they should be available to US FDA and EMA, that is the uh, European Medicine Agency, or to any other uh, you know, drug regulator in, in the world. So that is our tragedy. Uh, yes, Nandita? Sir, I have a question. Hold Can up. I just follow up? Okay, yeah, yeah. Sir, sir, so my question is uh, that this lack of data that Indian companies are having, is it because there is something wrong with the clinical trials or is it just because clinical trial, the because yesterday you mentioned that you know there is a host of activities and there is a different actor doing an activity starting from the writing so is it uh, does it have to do something with the cost they've performed it properly but because the costs are more therefore they're taking time or it's just because they have just fudged the data and submitted whatever rudimentary is there because <laughs> i also looked at cdso's website and actually i'll just share a, a small anecdote so my father uh, uh, he is a paralytic patient. So I was very skeptical of, uh, you know, uh, getting him vaccinated. So when I looked for Covaxin, one of the drugs he takes is uh, Clopregel, which is uh, a blood thinning uh, tablet. So Covaxin, when I looked for uh, their uh, uh, nine page sheet that they had submitted to CDSO, they had checked for compatibility with that drug. Whereas with respect to Covishield, we initially got a lot of uh, questions with respect to uh, people getting uh, blood clots and you know dying because of the same so I was a little skeptical but again I, I like everyone I couldn't find any data on uh, on what basis or how many people they checked or you know on what basis are they saying so so again my question is is it uh, they have just randomly checked on 100 people and they're scaling up and saying we've checked it on 10,000 uh, something like that and this is my question with Zydus also and this has been a question with others I have never in my life met a person who says I have undergone a clinical trial. If <laughs> the requirement is of that, you know, you test phase three trials for at least 50,000 people, we should know some people. There are just one or two, you know, who we might know that, you know, this one has gone. So, for instance, this Haryana minister, Anil Vij, he got COVID after getting a COVID shield shot when it was in the clinical trial phase. And then the question was, how did you unblind the... How are you so sure that you know he got COVID shield and not a placebo? So what, whether whether the design was tinkered and whether it was unblinded for this particular minister. But my question is whether you conducted trials on very few people, very limited people than others. Well, my answer is uh, uh, is simply that uh, you know there there may be uh, some uh, data fudging or falsification, but. Uh, the extent to which it could be is uh, not uh, the kind that you are suggesting because uh, if they if they say do a, a few hundred a few hundred uh, participants and then show it as a 30000 or 40000 then you are in trouble you know so uh, i believe that uh, the number uh, they might have really uh, approached but the findings you know the 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 uh, efficacy of the clinical trial, the number of uh, adverse events recorded, their, uh, their recording may be poor, you know, and as a consequence, they may not be able to show good consistent data, you know, 
and uh, they may have to do more cleaning and whatever that is required in order to produce the the right kind of uh, outcome there so those things are possible that can be a possibility of uh, uh, indian um, uh, drug industry being very conservative and uh, since they have never encountered the the en environment you know regulatory environment of uh, of developed countries <coughs> where there is a there is a substantial uh, uh, progress on the issue of uh, making uh, clinical trial data available in the public domain you know we, that's the reason why you know they are reluctant to part and they think that this is a trade secret and uh, uh, so you can you can you, you can attribute it to some amount of uh, bad data you can attribute it to some amount of incompetence in uh, analyzing data and uh, to, to certain extent uh, to their uh, conservatism as 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 a industry as a as a company so I, I, I don't know, but uh, whether you had ever seen it. But in, uh, in from November, December last year, uh, we organized five uh, a series of five webinars on vaccine research when the vaccine research was at uh, the height, and we did invite uh, two three participants of the trials from Bombay, uh, whom we could discover, you know, because the trials are going on in public institution here. And so they came and talked about their experience of, of the trial. Um, well, uh, I think uh, Salem Institute had a British study here that yesterday I was talking about on 1,200 people. And there was a one major serious adverse event in Chennai when a person got a neurological problem. And uh, he sued the company for a crore rupees uh, compensation. And the company slapped a defamation case against him asking for five crore rupees, you know, as a compensation. And it still remains there. So uh, once they were given uh, approval, then it is clinical trial phase is over. You know, both the vaccines were given approval, you know. And then uh, what becomes is, is a vaccination phase. And the vaccination, when there are adverse events, they are called uh, AEFI, adverse event following immunization. And there are large number of uh, AEFI reported from uh, Covishield as well as Covaxin. And they are, uh, but they are very inadequately investigated. Actually, if you read the uh, media news, you will find that uh, we, we wrote three major letters signed by some 30 scientists, uh, ethicists, and, uh, and doctors uh, to the government of India demanding a thorough inquiry into the cluster of deaths which took place because of the cardiovascular problem and neurological problem but the afi committee at the national level is refusing to do it and what they have done is uh, they have in most of the cases i think bearing one or two they have said that they had nothing to do with the vaccine the deaths were not related to the vaccine our concern was that uh, if these deaths uh, get reported then there will be hesitancy of the people in taking vaccine. But government uh, is uh, more interested in uh, creating a mandate on vaccine. Like say, my wife was, you know, today going from uh, uh, Andheri to Chajgat by, by local train in Bombay. The one thing that you have to produce to show that, that you have taken both the doses of the vaccine. It's called vaccine mandate. So if, if I want to travel to, you know, your, your, your place, I will have to have a, not only the, the, the RT-PCR test, but also show the, the vaccine uh, certificate. So they think that by putting this restriction, you are going, you, are, you will be able to force people to, uh, to take vaccine irrespective of whatever are the side effects at the moment. But uh, overall, uh, my understanding is that uh, whatever side effects which have been reported, major side effects I'm talking about, serious side effects, they are uh, much less uh, in terms of uh, you know the percentage of people who have taken uh, vaccine uh, concern as compared to the uh, serious uh, events which takes place if you get COVID. So, uh, uh, so we are uh, we, we we don't believe that the vaccine should be opposed 
we are trying to do more scientific criticism and saying that uh, when a person gets a, a serious adverse event for that person it is a it is a really a devastation you say and in that case uh, government should have uh, a plan to provide uh, medical care free and uh, to provide uh, some amount of compensation now this kind of compensation is available say in usa you know they have a, they have a policy of providing you know company vaccine shield that is uh, companies are not having liability but the government itself has a has, has a very good uh, program which uh, without uh, looking at uh, who was at fault they try to find out if there is any relationship with the vaccine and if it is then they provide uh, medical care as well as uh, compensation i think indian government should do it but uh, uh, they are not listening but as uh, some of you who are more uh, powerful you know as a lawyer uh, can uh, can get some good judgments from the higher judiciary to make indian government to reconsider i think it is a it is a very human uh, demand it is not a demand to to denigrate vaccine it is actually to make uh, people to support vaccination you know if if i know that if i take vaccine and something goes wrong there is a government who will stand by my family give me medical care if i die they will give some compensation so my family doesn't have to su suffer uh people will not will have less hesitancy in taking vaccine but uh, uh, that is a at what i would call rational uh, approach but the politics is not always rational you know about it. you know that's how uh, how they do it they said well people are just lining up for vaccination so why should we give all this thing to them and uh, so that is how it is and i think uh, scientifically i would like them to receive some support if something goes wrong during vaccination. Yeah. That answers that question. It's not I, just government. I wrote a paper on vaccine, uh, hesita uh, va sorry, vaccine mandates way back in uh, January this year. It's still not published. It's still pending. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I was asked to revise. I submitted a revised draft. And uh, I don't know if they'll publish because it goes against the agenda of the government. So. <laughs> yeah 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 uh, let me do a quick presentation and let me tell you what i'm going to cover uh i am going to cover uh, some historical part i love history you know and uh, that is simply because uh, i'm not a i'm not a practicing lawyer you know i am a medical doctor uh, but uh, my interest uh, in law is to see how the laws develop and as students i believe that uh, if you know how and why a law develops then uh, you will be able to understand law much better and uh, in its context you know what are the uh, strengths and limitations so what i'm going to do is that uh, i will look at what we call controversies in the in the clinical trial so look at the history of it internationally and in india as quickly as possible and uh, also look at why uh, uh, clinical trials got controversies and then how the laws uh, have developed uh, and the ethics regulation have developed in response to those controversies and uh, then I go quickly through a uh, uh, eight point uh, ethical framework that we use uh, uh, in order to understand whether a clinical trial is ethical or not and then uh, i will take up certain issues in the in the context of indian law and uh, there are the three issues i will take today the rest i will take tomorrow three are clinical equipoise therapeutic misconceptions and you all know and i know i know that lawyers like uh, the the consent part so this is a uh, 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 international history documented uh, by uh, who and uh, uh, they you know uh, divide history into six phases the whole uh, understanding is that uh, when we talk about law and ethics regulation we should first try to find out from where they came from you know so I, law all these regulations are in response to certain controversies and controversies are about uh, how uh, some uh, some unethical clinical trials are carried out and uh, then they get converted into 
some kind of guidelines, and then uh, they get converted into some law. So controversies are are, are in a way a real uh, driving force of new laws. And, and 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 it is very ironical, you know. On one hand, uh, you don't like anybody to suffer, but the reality is that. Uh, when uh, people's suffering takes place and somebody brings it out, then uh, some amount of, uh, of regulations are brought. And uh, governments being, uh, um, uh, you know, very pro-market, they would like uh, industry to operate uh, without any regulation to the extent possible. When the UN crisis starts, they try to change it. So let us start with the international. Before uh, uh, 1900, there were many abuses. You might have, you know, heard about uh, uh, quite a lot. But uh, some of the abuses uh, in the 19th century were uh, less discussed because uh, at that time, even the medical science itself was developing. And the doctors who were doing research, they oftentimes uh, tried out uh, new drugs or vaccine on themselves or their near, near ones, you know. The relatives. You must have heard about Edward Jenner and the smallpox vaccination. He first tried out the inoculation, you know, inoculation of that uh, vaccine on his nephew, you know, and then uh, he tried to do a clinical research and then uh, came out with a new vaccine. So it's a it's a very interesting thing to see that. The same uh, thing that I'm what I'm trying to describe here is another experiment. They are called Walter Reed experiments and yellow fever. They were done in Cuba, and uh, uh, you know, before they started this uh, this kind of experiment on uh, indentured labor and uh, soldiers, some of those uh, scientists themselves inoculated, you know, uh, infected themselves with the yellow fever, and one of them died also. So it's not that uh, the scientists were not serious about what they were developing. But you being a law student, if you go uh, do the internet search, searches, you will find that the Walter, Walter uh, Reed uh, uh, program actually signed contracts with the labor, which was uh, you know, poor people who were being brought to Cuba as laborer, and the soldiers who were stationed there in order to have law and order uh, uh, you know, uh, oversight. They all were told that if you go to Cuba, all of you will get uh, yellow fever sooner or later. So why don't you do one thing, that when you go there, some of you may be infected by us deliberately with the yellow fever, and we want to find out what happened. And when you are infected, we'll take care of you. So that way you will get free medical care, although there was no treatment available at that time. Yellow fever vaccine was not developed. So those contracts uh, are available uh, in uh, on the website. And uh, you should go through them and see how it was done. Oftentimes, uh, when we do clinical trials here, uh, same argument is put, is put forward. That in any case, you know, there is, you, you, you don't have money to buy the care. So why don't you pass? So that argument, the basis which was used at the time, it still remains. Nobody was punished. These are the documents available. You can have a look at it. Nobody ever lost job or uh, they were reprimanded. From 1900 to 1947, what is very interesting part in this period is that uh, the first country which brought about some kind of rules was Germany, Russia. And they had a law on consent that when somebody has to be recruited for clinical trials, Please take the permission of the person. But it is uh, very interesting to note also that it is the same period when the Germany carried out uh, all unethical clinical trials in the concentration camp. You all know about it, right? Concentration camp clinical trials. I can describe it in one full lecture, you know, the kind of trials they carried out. They wanted to find out what happens to a person who is, uh, you know, submerged uh, in the water uh, below freezing temperature. Because uh, when they were, uh, uh, they were bombing, uh, uh, bombing uh, uh, London or UK, 
their uh, their planes were getting shot and the, the pilots were falling in the in in the sea which was very very cold and they were dying you can replace uh, easily the, the the aircraft but to pilot you know you, you you have a very trained person and so they wanted to find out what kind of clothes they should wear how they should be protected and all so they put all these people there they did a lot of other experiments like you know which are all unethical without uh, any consent of the people and uh, those people were just treated like animals you know and this also tells you that uh, even if there is a general rule about consent if you do not consider a set of people as uh, good humans you don't respect them then uh, a law can get uh, implemented in a very discriminatory way so this law is good for certain kind of people those who are aryan they should be protected with consent but those who are not and those who are jews or other kind of people homosexuals whatever you know they don't have that consent protection and a large number of doctors got involved in doing it and uh, most of them got involved not because they were pressurized but they believed that they were doing something good for the humanity and that's how nuremberg trial took place and uh, the judgment of nuremberg trial on the doctors became what is called nuremberg court and that first time in a very codified manner explained that uh, informed consent should be the right of the participants in the clinical trial so this is a, a, a background to the nuremberg court and uh, uh, you must uh, uh, go through it it is available easily on the on the website at that time uh, during the nuremberg trial americans claimed that yo we have very good good uh, uh, you know uh, uh, regulation of the clinical trial when they actually had formed they didn't have but in the tribunal they they talked very loftily about it they brought out uh, all the violation by the germans but the violation which were done by uh, uh, japanese in china similar kind of violation and uh, the clinical trial which were unethical and inhuman they were not brought out so you will find that the japanese doctors were never put on the trial why because americans stuck with them uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, you know agreement that all the findings of the clinical trial will be passed on to them and they will be let loose and so nothing happened to them so after 1947 till 1966 americans never enacted a law they said that well uh, uh, american medical associations and other associations uh, will take care of it and so they left it to the profession till in uh, 1964 the first uh, uh, guideline ethical guideline came out it is called world medical association helsinki declaration 1964 have a look at it uh that started with that and uh, one fellow one doctor called harry henry beecher in new england journal of medicine in 1966 wrote a long paper providing documentation of 23 unethical trials including trials without consent without any knowledge on orphanage uh, inmates on uh, prisoners and uh, they also injected uh, various kinds of, uh, uh, of 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 germs to the people without they knowing about it they also carried out trial of injecting cancer cells in in people's body all those 23 unethical trials are published in a, in a high impact uh, uh, medical journal for new england journal of medicine this 1966 paper of henry beecher is available on the uh, on the internet freely so you can have a look at it only up from 1966 to 74 little oversight developed that was because of the impact of world medical association and the new england journal paper so they started you know fda started having committees to have a look at the protocol before uh, it was given permission but still it remained very very rudimentary in 1972 there was a big revelation that uh, with the uh, support of ni national institutes of health that is american um, american version of uh, icmr was supporting a clinical trial that was started in 1932 40 years 
they had recruited uh, black or african american who were uh, suffering from syphilis they wanted to find out that if you don't treat syphilis what happens to them how do they gradually die and what kind of organs get affected so end result of the of, 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 of the trial was that so more than 500 people were put on the clinical trial of this kind and for 40 years they were absorbed without providing any care in 1945 during second world war the penicillin was developed and everybody knew that penicillin was excellent you know for treating syphilis but these people were not provided actually they were prohibited from taking syphilis and in 1972 the media brought out all this stuff actually every year a paper based on Tuskegee trial it was called Tuskegee trial were published in the medical journal but nobody cared because if you are doing uh, this kind of research on poor people, the people who read this finding, they not, do not question those type of clinical trials. So this Tuskegee trial scandal, it is, it is a, a well-known scandal. And uh, there are films made on it. If you are interested, you can have a look at uh, HBO, the Hollywood, Hollywood film, a, a, a film which is a, a feature film. But Miss Evers' Boys was made. The film was first, first made as, as a play in on the Broadway. And after that, this film was made sometime in mid-90s. It is also available on the YouTube. You can have a look at it. It's called Miss Evers' Boys. Eunice Evers was a, uh, was a, uh, was a nurse uh, involved in this clinical trial. So for 40 years, they observed them without providing care in order to find out what happened. To the to the people who were suffering from it, and uh, because of this scandal, they appointed uh, a Belmont committee, and uh, Belmont committee came out with various reports and uh, uh, certain uh, principles for the clinical research, and uh, U.S. FDA regulations were formulated at that time, and one of the cornerstone of all of the regulation was that every clinical trial in the institution will be reviewed by the IRB, Institutional Review Board or Ethics Committee. That is what we are all following today in India. In 1982-99, uh, in additional issues came up, HIV AIDS epidemic, there was no treatment for it, and HIV positive people were demanding that they, sh they should be allowed to participate in the clinical trial. So protection, not replace according to me that protection was added uh, uh to the to the to the to the uh, uh, replace uh, being part of the clinical trial as a as a right of the people was added there and the last phase that started in 2000 is about collaboration you know that yesterday i talked about outsourcing of clinical trial and that kind of stuff all those things uh, are now part of it and uh, we are also discussing about the kind of uh, um, you know uh, contracts that are done so uh, justice issues in the contract and uh, what you call ethics dumping or the double standard a clinical trial will ethically may not be permitted in usa or europe but they will come and do the clinical trial in india such things have, have happened even recent times in india so this is a uh, this is a long history, more of a panoramic history that you can have. This is a summary of how the things develop. The World Medical Association Helsinki Declaration that I talked about has undergone various versions. Every few years, uh, they come out with a new version to have a uh, more rights of the participants included in it. The latest version at the moment applicable is 2013. And in this 2013, I think the Indian contribution was that they have first time talked about compensating people who participate in the clinical trial and they suffer from injury. So that is there. WHO has also done uh, its own uh, bit. They came out first uh, guidelines in 2002, and the latest one is 2017. Most of the standards of WHO guidelines are similar to the the World Medical Association Declaration of Helsinki, but it goes much, much uh, further than that. 
and with more details. You also know about the pharmaceutical companies. Because of the internationalization of the clinical trials, in 1996, they came out with a, a good clinical practice guideline. It is called ICH GCP. You might have heard about it. You must have a look at it. They are all available free on, on the internet. And you know about the WTO and uh, patent related issue. I'm not going to go into patent because that is not my specialization, but I'm just going to keep our keep, uh, focus on, uh, on the clinical trial. Well, India had its own share of uh, uh, controversy. <laughs> Pre-1980, there are, uh, you know, about the Drugs and Cosmetic Act was pa uh, passed and the it's the, it's the regulations uh, were brought about, and then <clears throat> it was revised uh, and modified uh, in early 60s. You know about the Patent Act of 1970s, which uh, uh, gave boost to the generic drug production in India. So in 1980, you know, under the impact of the Tuskegee trial and Belmont Commission, the India first time came out with a guideline, or ICMR guideline. So that was the first uh, guidelines that came out. And uh, it was prompted uh, uh, because uh, uh, the American funders as well as uh, WHO refused to give grants to Indian research unless they had uh, you know, ethics review done. So you will find that in the preamble of the first ICMR guideline that the WHO requirement is to have ethics review. So what they did, they talked about informed consent, they talked about uh, formation of EC, uh, ethics committee, but they made it uh, voluntary as per the requirement of the, of, of, or the demands of the donor, uh, sponsor. So it was not made mandatory, but it did provide an inclination or, 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 or indication in which direction the uh, coming time, uh, the, the regulations will be developing. And you know that in 1988, uh, uh, we came out, we started implementing Schedule Y and of the Drugs and Cosmetic Act. And so approval of the DCGI became very, very important. And uh, some monitoring of the clinical trials started. Now, these things happen, ICMR guidelines and 1988 Schedule Y, because of certain controversies. They are not. They were not well documented some time back. But in last 15 years, in Indian Journal of Medical Ethics, we have published series of articles on that. And as a as a result, some documentation has taken place. In India, between 1974 to 1990, a clinical trial done by Indian uh, researcher with the Indian support was carried out on carcinoma cervix. The Tuskegee trial was to find out the natural history of uh, syphilis. This was to find out natural history of uh, carcinoma cervix. There is a precursor of the carcinoma cervix, a kind of a plaque, a dysplasia on the cervix of the woman. And uh, they believe that if they can find out which, which dysplasia turns into cancer, then they will be able to provide better services to those women. And so they had a thousand women who were kept without providing any treatment for six years. And uh, they were just followed up for six years without providing any care. And many of them developed carcinoma. Now, this uh, study information came out in 1997. I think in 1997, uh, one journalist from the statement uh, brought uh, a cover page story and then became a big scandal. But as that was the reason why in uh, 19, uh, uh, you know, um, in 2000, the ICMR decided to bring the bring out new guidelines. Or uh, you can also say that it was the impact of that uh, which uh, led to uh, Schedule Y activation. In 1986, there was a big uh, controversy about uh, uh, clinical trial of the injectable contraceptive Depo Provera, where in Hyderabad. They found that the women were being recruited on the clinical trial by giving them promise that this was the best new contraceptive available when they were actually doing experiments, and uh, that may have also acted as a as a as a, as a trigger for the Schedule Y becoming activated in that time. 
And then there is a latest one, uh, uh, quite a few articles on that you will find uh, in uh, Indian Journal of Medical Ethics is 1998 to 2016. That is a visual inspection uh, of a carcinoma cervix, uh, you know, by using acetic acid. And that screening trial that was done in slums of Mumbai, and that was an 18 years trial, where the women, half of the women, 75,000 in the experimental arm where the screening was done, 75,000 were not provided any screening. And uh, they wanted to find out whether the control arm develops more carcinoma and the women die because of the carcinoma as compared to the arm where uh, 75,000 women were there who were provided screening. And this was done by one of the top most uh, uh, cancer research institute, you know, Tata Memorial Hospital, and uh, with the support of the NIH. And uh, this is the case study that uh, we have written internationally also. It is published as a part of uh, a book published by the European Commission. And uh, uh, that is done by Sandhya Srinivas and Veena Johri. Veena Johri is a lawyer and me. And uh, uh, so that is a well-documented uh, stuff that you can look at. So these are the things that uh, uh, prompted uh, in India also. So India had its own share of uh, of uh, different kind of uh, clinical trials. And VIA trial, that carcinoma service screening trial, did not fall into a, a, a drug trial. It was screening, you know, using a using a diagnostic test. Now. A, a public interest litigation was filed on it by Sanjay Srinivasan, who is a journalist, in Supreme Court. And uh, uh, it was argued out that by not providing to 75,000 women who were in the control arm any kind of screening, they should have screened uh, them with uh, standard, standard screening, which is a uh, pap smear. But they did not. They just uh, left them as they were. Uh, they allowed them to develop carcinoma. The Supreme Court refused to entertain that uh, petition, so it failed. But what happens in 2019, when the new city regulations are brought, they have also included regulation over the non-drug uh, non trials. So you'll find that uh, uh, so the, the non-drug trials are also now supposed to, you know, legally, be uh, reviewed by the ethics committee and those ethics committees are supposed to be um, registered with the department of health research while those ethics committees who do a review of uh, drug trials they are supposed to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, you know registered with the with the drug controller general of india so this is the history I hope uh, uh, you will uh, read more history and try to understand why this kind of things are uh, brought in there. Let me go through this, uh, what we call the ethical framework for research or benchmark. When you look at clinical trials, see that these eight principles are satisfied. <clears throat> First is social value. When you do clinical trial, it must be for the good of the society good of the health system. If you do clinical trial, which uh, adversely affects the society, for instance, you do clinical trial with uh, the anthrax or bioweapon, they are all destructive. And uh, they are not considered to have a social value. So social values are very, very important. That it should not adversely impact the, the, the system. It should be able to provide information that strengthens it, makes it better. Second uh, principle is very simple. I had told you that uh, a research is one where uh, scientific methodology is involved. So if it is not a scientific research, then by as a thumb rule, it is unscientific. So you have to look at the protocol of the clinical trial in order to understand whether it is being scientifically done or not. So ethics committee has a responsibility to look at the science because if it is not scientific, then it could be unethical. For instance, the Tuskegee trial, where they, for 40 years they, 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 they observed the people without providing care. Now, that was scientifically not a problem. It was a good science, but it was unethical. 
the same information they could have found out by looking at the cohorts of patients who were reporting at the different stages of, of syphilis. And then putting together that information, they could have put together the entire natural history of the, uh, of the syphilis. They didn't require to, you know, get people as guinea pigs without any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, uh, pro, uh, care for being provided. So this is very, very important that uh, a science which infringes on ethics needs to be revised. That's how when I sit on the ethics committee, when I find that uh, the kind of design or kind of proposition, scientific proposition they are coming out with is infringing on the ethics, then we ask for the changes in the methodology in such a manner that uh, it does not infringe on the rights of the participants. The third is very important. You must have noticed that the informed consent comes as fourth. The third is very important that uh, your clinical trial should have provide more benefit to the participant than uh, create risk for that person or harm to the person. Risk benefit ratio is very, very important. And uh, in medicine, we have, uh, uh, you know, four principles. The first principle is do no harm. Second is that do benefit. If you put them together, what you are ultimately doing is risk benefit. The benefit should be more than the risk. This analysis of the clinical trial is very, very important. And it is fundamental. If there is higher risk than the benefit, then the clinical trial should not take place irrespective of whether the people are providing consent or not. Because it is not going to benefit to the person. Informed consent is the fourth one. I'm going to have a more thing, a discussion on there. Fair selection of study participants. You can't keep uh, recruiting only poor people and uh, vulnerable people. It should be cross-section of the population that should be studied. Otherwise, what happens is that uh, you all the burden of uh, your uh, clinical research uh, will, be ca will be carried by, by the poor people and not uh, the rest of the population. Ethics committee should be independent. That is the sixth requirement. It should not be under the control of either the company or the sponsor or the institution where it is being done. Now, that is a very, very tall question to ask. We can have a separate discussion sometime on the ethics committee. And third, seventh one is that once you have recruited participants, you must respect them. You see that their, their confidential informations are not leaked. And uh, in the larger trials, you have to have a community engagement so they know what is happening and collaborative partnership, issue of justice in the clinical trial agreement, investments in the training and capacity building. Otherwise, they said that, well, in America and Europe, they are all much better trained and when you hear people are not there. So they don't provide authorship to Indian researchers. Another question is that what happens in the collaboration after the research is over? Do Indians get the drug which were tried on India? Or they have a right to market the drug at such a price that those who actually participate in the, in, in the clinical trial never get it. So these are the eight major uh, areas that we normally look at, right? And uh, some of them will, will go into details. Let me take a few issues very quickly and then you can ask questions. The first issue is the clinical equipoise. When we talk about the experimental arm where the experimental treatment is given and the control arm where the standard treatment is given, what we are looking at, what is called equipoise. First thing is that anybody who believes that the new drug that is being experimented upon is better than the current drug should not get involved in the, in the research. Because you are going to do experiments simply because there is a credible doubt about the relative therapeutic merit of the some set of interventions that target a specific medical condition. So unless there is an uncertainty about the new drug, you cannot do the experiment. And if you have a certainty that it is better than or the worse than the, the currently available uh, drug, then it should not be done at all. So in the informed consent form, if it is written that I am inviting you to uh, you know, join this clinical trial because the new drug that we are uh, trying out is supposed to be better than the currently available drug. Then I would say that don't do research. If it is better, then you should be providing it. 
Why are you doing research on it? Right? So this is what is called clinical equipoise. This is a, a details of it. I don't go into it because we don't have time. But if you have a question, I'll go into that. So what it stipulates, you know, this, uh, 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 this uh, clinical equipoise. It says that doctor has a duty of personal care of the participant. And if doctor believes that uh, currently available care is better than the experimental care, then that duty, you know, tells you that uh, currently available care should be given. And you should not put the patient into the clinical trial. There, uh, there, is, a, uh, there is no certainty whether the person will get currently available care or the experimental care. So this is the duty of care of the doctor. The doctor has to ascertain who is now the research investigator. He has to invest, he has to con convince credibly through scientific evidence that there is uncertainty whether the new drug is better or worse than the currently available one. So it is a duty, that is what it underscores. And uh, it uh, should have some credible evidence from the phase one and phase two clinical trials that by doing the trial, it will advance the patient's interest. Very, very important uh, issue. This consideration helps to ensure that the clinical trial is just or fair by mandating that the interests of the individuals and subjects are valued equally. You cannot sacrifice few people who participate in the clinical trial for the sake of the, of the larger society. They have a right of their life as much as the larger society has. The second issue that I want to talk about, and there is a, uh, only two three styles uh, now, is therapeutic misconception. You know, the CT participants are usually patients under the treatment by the physician who has agreed to be principal investigator of the site of the clinical trial, like hospital or clinic. So my doctor is also now a researcher. Now, which role will be primary role becomes very, very important. There may be conflict of interest between the two. In CT for prevention, like vaccine, a public health authority is having responsibility of disease prevention in the community, often collaborates with the clinical trial. The participants are thousands of individuals from the community. The CT gets credibility in the eyes of the participant as if I am being asked to participate then I will look at the credible because my doctor is saying it or my public health authority is saying that this section I should go and participate. Patients and the communities believe or trust that the treating doctor or the public health authorities have a best interest in their mind. My best interests are with the patient, with the doctor. And so if he suggests me to participate in the clinical trial, I'll participate. This is the trust issue. So such context make the participants ignore the fact that they were being recruited for an experiment. I think yesterday somebody has raised this issue that patients oftentimes don't know that they are on the clinical trial. And that is what is the reason. You know, they sign on it without realizing that they were signing for an experiment. Because they trust their, their doctor or they, we trust uh, our public health authority when a vaccine is being tried. Thus a situation of therapeutic misconception is created where participants keep believing that the clinical trial is for their best interest and not an experiment. Right? So we oftentimes forget that we are in experiment. We just think that this is being done for my best interest. Well, what is the reality is that uh, it, is, it is a trial. What are the remedies? The remedies is that in the consent process, adequate care is needed to dispel the misconception that this is a, a standard care being provided. They must be told that this is an experiment, this is an experiment, this is an experiment. Anything can happen. In it. Now, that uh, oftentimes is missing. They don't use the term experiment at all. They keep saying this is research, this is research, and people are very enamored by the idea of research. Person taking consent should be separated from the investigator, doctor, and the public health authority. If my doctor is taking my consent, I oftentimes will blindly sign it. But if there is a third person, a social worker or somebody else, who is doing it, then I'm going to ask questions. 
and then I will become very, very aware that I am on the clinical trial. Doctor or the public health authority should not directly recruit the participants. Best thing to do is to put up uh, advertisement. Those who suffer from a disease or those who are ready to participate in a clinical trial, let them come forward and, uh, and join. Then it becomes uh, quite uh, voluntary. This is the last slide. I know you will have a lot of questions for the consent, but uh, this is very simple thing that I am putting here. One has to make the assessment of the competence to give consent. You know the age of consent and all kind of stuff. In the case of children, you have to take assent in addition to the consent of the parents. Voluntariness assessment is the most difficult part because it's not just informed consent. It is voluntary informed consent. Vulnerable people who are under the lot of pressure of the structural comp compulsion, you know, they, they have, uh, they, they participate simply because there is no other care available. So they say, okay, if I go in clinical trial, I have 50% chance of getting something. So if, uh, all the health, uh, you know, uh, all the participants are provided complete health insurance and then asked to participate in the clinical trial. You will find that the response is different. Some of them will not participate. They say, no, 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 I have got health insurance fully covered. So I have current uh, uh, you know, care I am getting. I don't want to get into the clinical trial. Only those who are really volunteer, want to volunteer, they will participate. There should not be any physical or psychological coercion. All of you know that. They have, should have right to withdraw at any stage, and refusal or withdrawal will not result into the non-provision of care. You must see that that is written in the consent very clearly, and uh, that they will provide the standard care free of charge, even if I don't participate. And there should be not be any undue inducement, you know, offering large amount of money and that kind of thing. It's a very controversial issue. In a clinical trial, as I was telling you yesterday, in phase one, they give a lot of money. But we can discuss it, whether it is good or bad. Uh, information part, all critical information, ICMR guidelines provide a full list of the information that should be there. You must check that. You should not use deception, falsehood, concealment of information. So that's how you have to compare the informed consent form with the protocol of the of the study in order to find out whether they are concealed something or not. Assessment of comprehension. Just giving information is not sufficient. You need to find out that the person has understood the information. Nowadays, it is becoming standard that after giving information, there should be questions asked to the participant to understand whether they have understood or not. And that's why many people argue that don't call it informed consent. Call it understood consent. With all this thing, you can tell me whether genuine in consent is possible or not. Your view. Okay, this is uh, it today. And uh, uh, we can have questions if you have uh, on the subject uh, uh, or any other topic. Tomorrow, I will be taking up many other topics, including uh, serious adverse events, post-trial uh, access, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, transparency in clinical trial. The, the medical journals and what we call the gross management of clinical trial and all. So uh, that is for tomorrow. Any any comment or question is welcome. I think there are something in chat box. Let me see what it is. Oh, that's the movie I had put it. Yeah, Miss Eva's voice. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, when we do the uh, teaching in uh, ethics in clinical trial, we normally show this. And uh, okay. it takes about uh, one and a half hours. It's a two hours film. And it takes another one and a half hours for discussing the film in detail. Okay. Yeah, it's a very interesting film. And uh, at the end, uh, you will get moved by uh, by what is being portrayed there. Uh, they can watch it before tomorrow, maybe before the class. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Okay. Please go ahead. Just don't be still shy. Anything that you can ask, don't worry. I'm not a judge, you know. I'm a, I'm a simple uh, researcher like you. Oh, I know. Yeah, well. 
Ritupana. Yes, go ahead, Ritupana. Uh, so this is just a uh, just just a comment. So I had earlier read about informed consent in clinical trials, and I think the apart from the U.S. the syphilis trials, the uh, the first one which caught my attention was the contraceptive trials in Puerto Rico, where uh, I think it was for Enovid. And uh, so three deaths had occurred in that trial, but uh, it was never really confirmed and attributed to the clinical trial because no autopsy was done. So, I mean, it's difficult to imagine that the standards would be this lax now, but uh, it feels it, it feels a little peculiar to know that something which has been so beneficial for such a large population now was built on the foundations of uh, rural women who were um, who did not have any idea what they were being subjected to uh, i think this was just an observation that i made I was uh, muted. What you are talking about is the topic we will take up tomorrow. That is for serious adverse event. Uh, I, I use uh, uh, some case studies uh, for uh, serious adverse event, but we don't have that much of time. You know, for that you have a, need a, a session of about three hours. I was taking a, um, uh, such a session recently on serious adverse event uh, uh, for uh, uh, I think six or seven uh, uh, ethics committees. Uh, but uh, we can't go in that much detail. Sometime, if you have more time and you want to to learn about it, we can do it. But the 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 immediate response that I give is that uh, uh, it is irrespective of the of, of of the informed consent. You know, whatever consent you might you might have agreed, saying that well, uh, and it is written in the consent form that uh, while tra pa 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 participating in the clinical trial, there is also a possibility of that. But that does not mean that if the death takes place, there is no responsibility for the researcher and the sponsor. That is what is even Indian law. You know, if you read a new clinical trial rule, what it says is that you have to find out whether uh, death or injury was uh, because of the clinical trial. That is one. And if it was because of the clinical trial, then uh, you are eligible for, uh, for uh, compensation irrespective of whether that serious adverse event was mentioned in the in the in in, in the uh, informed consent form or not so once you pa give informed consent does not mean that you have given away all your rights tomorrow somebody writes in the informed consent saying that well you can do any kind of research on me and any kind of trial on me and anything can happen to me i'm ready to accept it that kind of thing is not acceptable you know that very well as a law student once upon a time, when I was a medical student in 1970s, you know, the uh, surgeon will not go to the patient to take informed consent. We were medical students and say, hey, come here, go and get the consent from the patient. So I'll go to the patient. And what is the consent written? So I hereby agree to undergo surgery, any surgery, by any of the surgeons of this hospital, public hospital, right? This is what is a blanket consent is taken, you know? and uh, Lawyers fought on it. They went to the court saying that blanket consent should consent should not be accepted. So even if you mention all the details, that does not rule out the negligence on the part of researchers in the in the clinical trial. It does not rule out that uh, because of uh, of the of the clinical trial, if I suffer from injury or die, I should not get the compensation. So compensation as a right is there irrespective of uh, whether it is related. But if re relatedness is very important, and it is most difficult part, there is no there is no real science which can tell you that uh, there is a relationship with the with the with the uh, you know experimental drug and the in and the in the serious adverse event. That is a major problem. It is all based on circumstantial evidence. There is no exact science of it. So the circumstantial evidence, like uh, when did it happen, right? Uh, is was there any evidence uh, in uh, animal study in phase one clinical trial, phase two clinical trial, a possibility of such a such an event to occur? Okay, 
is this event can all does this event can also take place because of the underlying disease that i am suffering from suppose you are in phase you know in a last stage of cancer and that last stage of cancer is going to bring about lot of adverse events because of the cancer itself right and now i am giving you a chemotherapy a new drug for experiment now how do i distinguish an adverse event which is coming from the cancer itself and adverse event that is coming from the drug so you'll have to look at the temporal relationship you have to see the other uh, you know connected events and uh, and 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 the history of of the of, of the earlier trials and all kind of stuff and then put it together and the last point yes autopsy is important but autopsy if it is not uh, done with an idea of detecting something that you want to detect then general autopsy has no value you know this forensic people do autopsy but they do it normally they are trained to do it in order to find out a crime okay so crime detection is the idea pathology is to the autopsy of this kind who try to understand pathology but in europe astrazeneca uh, vaccine was having a problem related to the blood clotting and the neurological issue they could find out simply because while doing autopsy they looked for it and they found that uh, the various vessels of the body they were having a uh, clotted blood in india more than 300 people have died under the astrazeneca that is a covid shield trial but nobody has done that kind of detail out of to find out whether in the blood vessels at different places there were clots or not so general autopsy is saying that we found the person died of a cardiac problem finish but that is not sufficient was a generalized uh, you know uh, blood clotting uh, uh, present or not you have to go into deeper analysis so how you do autopsy uh, for to detect uh, adverse events is equally important otherwise you won't find any evidence and as a consequence the committee will come to the conclusion that they are not related and so you don't get any compensation only for relatedness you get compensation that is a major problem so i have a point here yeah so can we reverse the burden of proof in saying that if a person is undergoing any kind of experimentation and death occurs then it should be presumed that it is a side effect of that drug and not otherwise and therefore the sponsor should be under a duty to direct what kind of uh, you know a uh, pathological test will be done or pathological autopsy will be done because likewise family at times there are people who whose family members do not even know that this person is undergoing uh, a A, a clinical trial i was reading about the certain youth in hyderabad who were uh, college going children above 18 uh, to get pocket money there are lot many contract research organizations there so their parents did not know that these people to support their uh, increasing expenditure are undergoing that so shouldn't it be the vice versa role here now the duty is on the people to prove that it is uh, i mean it's on the prosecution to prove that it was a death due to the adverse event and therefore they will have to go and claim for compensation but if the rule are, a rule is reversed in evidence then things might improve no i i fully agree with you that something like that. the the the, the uh, event that you mentioned in hyderabad that was a, a fellow called surinder who died in the in the bab trial and uh, and there is a, a excellent uh, documentary film uh, called body hunter uh it is almost 80 minutes long i have that i i, I was involved in helping them in making it at that time uh you must see it if you if you are able to art art tv in uh, europe um made that film they sent their researchers here can you repeat and, the name uh, the name of the film is uh, body hunter body i can I, i i hunter hunter body hunter the, the go around finding bodies for research you see <laughs> Okay. It's, 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 it's an excellent film with a lot of interviews from the from the slum areas why people participate and all excellent one i i, I have i have a copy because uh, the filmmaker and i worked uh, help each other on that but uh, uh, you know when uh, supreme court case was going on public interest litigation on clinical trials from 9 2010 to 2013 you know the under the pressure of the supreme court uh, the dcgi was forced to provide lot of data on the deaths in the clinical trial 
Hmm. And at the time it came out that about 125 persons who died were given compensation. The rest were not. So, but the data they were provided. So, I, what I did, I took up a, a set of data and analyzed them. Some 400, 500 deaths. You know, there were more deaths, but I got data only for where there was a there was a determination, which said that uh, you know there it was a, like this that. Uh, They were not able to find uh, definitely related or not related. So what they wrote, possibly related, probably related, right, or definitely related or not related. So my argument at the time was that that uh, even if you don't put the burden of proof on the on the on the company directly, if, if that is a big law to change, but. Uh, If there is a genuine doubt whether it is related or not, it may be possibly related, probably related, right? Then the benefit of doubt should go to the patient and not to the company. What company was doing was that was providing compensation only for those deaths where there was a, a determination saying that it is definitely related, but it will not provide compensation if it is possibly related. It is a you know probably. We, as doctors, we talk about possibly and probably because uh, the drug, the experimental drug, might not have caused the death on its own, but it might have enhanced or contributed in the death of the patient. Okay, so if it has contributed, then there is a possibility. Okay, so that. Is, but if if you are able to change the entire stuff, saying that they have to prove it. I will be very, very happy. You know, it happens in Tada cases and uh, UAPA and all, where uh, uh, the accused is under uh, pressure. Reverse onus <laughs> clauses. <laughs> so they will do there. You know, they will put the uh, burden of proof on the weak people, but they will not put the burden of proof on the powerful people. That's the major problem in the law making. If you are able to change it, I am sure it will have a repercussion internationally. Sir, is there any law in any country which places a reverse onus on companies doing it? <laughs> you know, America is the worst. You know what happens in most of these countries is that uh, people who participate in the clinical trial are covered by the health insurance. Okay. They have a national health insurance, or they have a like, company-sponsored health insurance, and that kind of stuff. While most of the people who participate in the clinical trial in India are poor people. Or low middle class people uh, who have no insurance. That's how. And one of the things that I suggested in my slide, you know, uh, on on the issue of uh, of, 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 of uh, this that let them all have first health insurance, complete coverage, and then you ask the person saying that, well, uh, would you like to participate in clinical trial? You will find that half of the people will say no. Whenever I see a proposal, you know, a, a paper which says that I went to 100 patients to do clinical trial, and all 100 agreed to participate, I become very, very suspicious of that research. Either you have not taken proper informed consent, you know, or dece deceived the pa pa patient. So how is it possible that everybody participates? Right. <laughs> so all, either all of them are poor, you know, like say a person who is having cancer. And uh, in order to treat my cancer, I require chemotherapy, which costs me fifty thousand rupees per month. I don't have that money. But if I... my doctor says that participate in clinical trial, you have fifty percent chance of getting this drug, which is costing you fifty thousand rupees a month, and fifty percent chances of getting a new drug, which is being experimented upon. I will join it, you know, because I have no money. In any case, I am going to die of cancer. So even if I die of experiment, what what difference does it make for me? Right? That's how mind. most of the people we call it uh, push factor. We call it uh, uh, you know using people's vulnerability uh, to to do the clinical trial, and that is one of the reason why a lot of clinical trials are coming to the developing country where there is no universal uh, uh, insurance of the people. That is the issue. America, you will find that large number of people will not participate. Yesterday we talked about, you know, that America. If you get a patient, the patient is already on a drug. So before you take that patient in the clinical trial, you have a washout period. So that current drug should wash out, and then you recruit the person there. And many of them will say no because they are already having health insurance and they are getting the current standard. So they won't participate. 
that's a that's a hesitancy to participate in clinical trial is very high in the developed countries so i guess we'll stop here today because we have another class <laughs> but of this course. is so fabulous and i was reminded of bedford's law of anomalous numbers so i was writing a paper for plagiarism and the same thing that you know if you get absolute results if you get results in multiples of 0 or 5 it means your data is fudged 100% chances that your data is fudged so <laughs> that's common sense to know you know that whether it is uh, true or not but uh, that's i mean that's mind boggling at times that how can people who are in the most noblest profession do this with their patients uh, but then also the pressing need of humanity to do but there are a lot many things the person researcher himself wanting to get famous himself wanting to get money a lot of pressures involving and uh, again lopsided laws that but i tell have. you i tell you if, you if you if you are the doctor and you know that your patient cannot buy the prescription drug that you are giving you know doctors uh, you know the good people can also get involved in unethical clinical trial not because they are bad you know but they just want to do something good for the patient at least the patient will get something today i can't give him anything and that is it is a more of a systematic issue it's not about the individual you know involved in clinical trial being bad people they are not devils you know they are not the villains that you see in the indian film you know Mm-hmm. they are like you and me but they end up doing certain things because the 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 context in which we survive and work uh, forces to i i i met uh, when i was doing research on clinical trial i met doctors in public hospitals and said that why are you doing clinical he said see my department doesn't have a single computer my de- my department doesn't have even cupboards to keep books you know so that my my young students can read it so when i do clinical trial i get uh, you know amount of money as an overhead which i can invest here and upgrade my department now this is the problem unless we invest in health and improve our health services some of the thing people will just do it simply you know out of goodwill but uh, may end up uh, harming the patient you know this is the problem Pickle. so they are not uh, individually yes. bad but uh, they are they are good individuals in a bad system trying to trying to do best and uh, end up uh, harming people you know that's how it is anyway we'll meet tomorrow again 3:00 yes, okay? Okay. okay thank, thank you, you so bye much bye. Yeah. bye 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 uh i hope you enjoyed the lecture all of you i just have one request please ask questions this is a fabulous opportunity i guess he's the best speaker we've got so far so if you like the topic please make use of this opportunity I'll see you tomorrow at three fifteen.